Good morning YouTube, Warbles on a lot here. Sunday, 8th of March 2015, just getting ready to record the Outsiders. There'll be a second broadcast with First Dog on the Moon. Outsiders, I'm Barry Cassidy and you're not. Yes indeed, thank you Uncle Barry. Uh, our Outsiders this morning, joined by Laura Tingle, political editor of the Australian Financial Review, Paula Mathewson, columnist with the drum and hoopla, Corporate Communications Specialist and Professor Sarah Joseph, Director of the Caston Centre for Human Rights Law here in beautiful downtown Monash University in Melbourne. Welcome to you all. Good morning. Morning. Uh, what an extraordinary week it, it was for the Prime Minister. A week in which Tony Abbott went from this... I've lost my mojo! ...to this. This is just how wonderful this... Uh, broad church that I lead is. <laughs> Obviously they've now broken down the last barrier and they've made the men only club admit women. Yeah. Admit women. Isn't that fantastic? At last, this nasty little show in this house is admitted women. They've admitted women and they've done it on International Women's Day because of the Liberal National Party. Yeah. Good on the Liberal National Party. Smashing the glass ceiling yet again. And a happy uh, International Women's Day to you, Laura Tingle. Um, what, that, I think, demonstrates the turnaround in Prime Ministerial fortune, that he could take uh, a, an event organised by the LNP in a men's-only club in, in Brisbane and, and turn it to some sort of advantage. Extraordinary work. It, it was an extraordinary turnaround. We've had we've had the uh, somersault and then the backward somersault, Jonathan, in the last month. I think everybody's head's spinning as a result. But... Uh, by the end of the week, uh, the Prime Minister's mojo was back, as was the Treasurer's. And uh, uh, I think apart from anything else, you could sort of just sense that, um, you know, a week ago they had a terrible, terrible week. Everything went wrong um, uh, as far as the backbench was concerned. Mm. Um, but the fact that that wasn't able to um, mobilise the backbench to uh, have a spill that it had been forecast. I think that really, more than even the good polls, just sort of entrenched the idea that uh, he was safe for the moment. He's he could uh, he could get on with it. He's uh, got a lot of uh, problems ahead, a lot of uh, a lot of ground to make up. But uh, it's just given him that opportunity to reassert himself. I think. What does it say, Paula Matheson, about the way in which we will practice and and view politics that things can as Laura says, be, be quite acrobatic, quite so gymnastic, that everything happens with such speed, but with such conviction in the end that we're in somewhere entirely new, even if it only lasts for the next three days. Well, that's always the risk of getting too close to things, Jonathan. And and uh, <laughs> um, and, and I and I as I note that uh, you have decided to withdraw from Twitter for uh, the next few weeks to see what that whether that has a difference. Well, I thought I'd experiment um, to, with actually reading well, articles to the end rather. Yeah, than well, <laughs> well it, indeed, and and I guess uh, I mean. I, I equally try to um, keep away from getting too close to things by not necessarily watching all, what's going on on Twitter, you know, watching what's going on with every single press conference and, and what have you, because then you do you know, tend to, um, you know, fall into the trap of, of, of just you know, living in that particular moment and letting it take things uh, take you away and that's certainly not what the rest of the community does and uh, um, we need to, mm. to keep in mind of that fact. That's an interesting distinction Sarah Joseph isn't it that that outsider inside of you and I mean we had that bit of polling uh, at, the, at the beginning of the week that just seemed to change everything and I'm not sure that the rest of us have that sort of sense that that's so significant. Well it was a good week uh, for the Prime Minister um, I think mainly because it wasn't a bad week, and it's the first it's the first such week we've had probably since Australia Day. Uh, moving to the poll, I think um, I think this poll was significant, but it, it shows how much polls seem to drive the political narrative in this country now, which which is worrying. I mean, we even had news limited outlets trumpeting a fair a Fairfax poll, which I, I think is unusual, and this poll may or may not be a blip, but. Even if it's not, a, let, let's assume it's not a blip, well, then it really shows how fickle the electorate is. And um, given the volatility, I'm not really sure that polls at this stage really therefore have any meaning. If you, if you live by the poll, Laura, presumably you also die by the poll. 
Uh, well, that's always been the case. Um, I, I, I suppose I have this uh, issue about the polls, though. I mean, it, yes, they have this transformative effect. Um, but as I said earlier, I, I think um, the, the change in dynamics was as much driven by um, what happened in the party room because, because of that split we've got at the moment between how things are, se are seen by MPs and how things are seen by the electorate, going back to the point Paula made. Mm. I mean, most people have just this, have these sort of fleeting impressions of politics and um, the, uh, the sort of, shall we say, the cynical pragmatic, pragmatic strategists were saying uh, all the voters are concerned about are baddies and berries. And um, <laughs> as long as you're playing to those sorts of ideas and looking like you're addressing them, they'll just go, oh, yeah, well, he's, yeah, you know, I don't like him, but he's doing something about the baddies and the berries. Now, th that's a, a very cynical take on it, but that's what um, politicians uh, are playing to at the moment, that, that they know that um, while we may all get very exercised by all these things and even the back bench might, in terms of those poll numbers, that's what they're basically thinking will drive them. What, what and I suppose you, I'd also just, if I just yeah, sure. sort of say, what, what's happened with the polls, if you try to draw a line through them over the last few months, is the um, news poll a fortnight ago and uh, our Fairfax poll this week basically returned the Prime Minister or returned the two-party uh, vote <laughs> to where it was in December, which wasn't good. And, in fact, Tony Abbott's personal approval ratings are even weaker, but they're back. They've jumped back up from the absolutely catastrophic levels post Prince Philip. What what did happen in that party room? I mean, that's that's the interesting point in all of this is that that sort of shift of sentiment. Is this is this victory for for Tony Abbott or is this just defeat for for Malcolm Turnbull? Where, where is the the mood of the party room focused, Laura? Uh, well, I think um, it's it's you, there are all these different trends going on there, Jonathan. One of them is that um, there are a lot of people who really just don't want Tony Abbott to stay. Uh, but what has happened is we've seen this resurgence of the um, of the right uh, to do the sort of anything but Abbott, uh, sorry, anything but Turnbull mm. uh, push. And I think you've now got this splintering where um, I think one of the most significant things that happened at the end of um, last week, as in a week ago, which didn't actually get a, a huge run at the time. I mean, it was all, it was reported, but its significance wasn't really appreciated, I don't think, which was that Julie Bishop um, essentially told Malcolm Turnbull when he asked her that she wouldn't run as a running mate with him. She was going to put her, uh, her hand up as well. So that means that the right has an alternative candidate to uh, Malcolm Turnbull if, if they pragmatically decide that Tony Abbott just can't go back to the next election. So... You started to see the splintering. You saw Andrew Robb being suggested as, a, as somebody who might put his name up as an alternative candidate, people talking about Scott Morrison. So the whole thing's fractured a lot. And um, I think that's left the party room going, well, we're not sure what we're going to do now. I wanted to, to turn to the intergenerational report, which was uh, well a, a fairly significant moment uh, in, in the past week. And, and Paula, for, for, for many reasons, I mean, its predictions are obviously sketchy and anything which, which throws us 40 years in the future must be so. There was a telling piece, and I think it was Tim Colbatch made it, if you were trying to imagine uh, 2015 from 40 years ago, you would have missed things like, you know, the internet, for example. So your, your predictions would be somewhat askew. Why do we invest so much in something, Paula, that, that it is so obviously ropey, that is so obviously unpredictable? Uh, purely for communications terms, Jonathan, this is this is all about setting, uh, perhaps um, ploughing the land so that you can then sow the seeds of whatever uh, story it is that you're trying to tell. Uh, that's that's always been the purpose of the intergenerational report to 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 give some uh, basis <coughs> and some strength and credibility to whatever it is that uh, that a government's trying to do in in a budgetary sense. Um, there's never been any suggestion that it hasn't been a political report. It is a political report and I think perhaps this one is even more political than, than those in the past. Um, but I, 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 would, I would suggest that hockey's gone too far this time in, in 
uh, casting it as a political report to the extent now that it's it's not a genuine basis for, for talking about what needs to be done in, um, in preparation for the future. And it's just going to be dis dismissed as, as something that's that's purely partisan and not useful at all. On the outside of the bubble, Sarah Joseph, do we do we get that distinction quite clearly? Do we do we sense that this is or do we take something like this on face value that it is a, a, a sober reflection of the future of the country and we would tend not to see the politics on the outside of the political circle i well, it's difficult for me to talk for other people i mean i i would suggest that a lot of people would question the utility of it i mean it's a snapshot of what the next 40 years will look like based on assumptions that everyone knows will be wrong um, the, this particular report largely ignored climate change, um, didn't have much to say about superannuation, and it can't say anything about technolo technological changes that we don't even that we don't know about yet. Uh, so I do wonder whether people think it's as important as it is. Um, as for the politics of it, um, I think one interesting aspect, and I think this was picked up by Paul Kelly, is well. Um, even if one takes it at face value, where does the government go from here? We know that its budget last year was extremely unpopular. Um, are they going to simply try and reintroduce something similar? Um, I suspect not, given the politics of that would just be perceived as too dangerous, which means that they might end up kind of ignoring their own partisan report. That's a really interesting point, isn't it, Laura Tingle? That the, the, and Kelly, Sarah mentions there, Paul Kelly, and he puts it thus, that the government's trapped between its political imperative to retreat and its financial imperative to stand firm. And we see, we see further evidence of that conundrum with with the talk now around the uh, the, the pension indexation and, and changes there. We've seen the GP co-payment go. The government, Laura, almost seems to be putting the emphasis on other people to come up with plans. It's sort of saying, well, where's yours, Labor Party? I mean, how does it get beyond, how does it get out of that, that sort of cleft, uh, that cleft mm. stick of those two things? Well, my sense is that the government's been learning in reverse or learning rather late about how you actually do stuff. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's a, a, there's, I mean, part of what's happened is we've, we've got this uh, sort of warrior type uh, completely partisan politics, particularly in the last five years, which you have to say is, you know, reached its zenith with Tony Abbott as opposition leader, but um, you had the Labor Party uh, under, from Simon Crean onwards um, tending to take a much more oppositionist approach. And it's dawned on cabinet ministers only in the last few months. Uh, wait a minute, this might not actually work for us altogether. <laughs> that you know that we might actually have to do this a little bit differently in our own interest. So, it's, I mean, I'm not talking peace and love, but that they they have to actually be a little bit pragmatic about these things. And in some ways, it's it's been quite <coughs> shocking to me to sort of suddenly see ministers discover that they may have to grandfather arrangements. That is. Mm okay, we're going to change the pension, but we're not going to change it for people who are already on the pension or, you know, superannuation, whatever the policy is. I mean, it's just it's just a standard thing you do when you've got radical change. And if anything, I mean, the intergenerational report probably has come to connote a whole heap of things to people that it was never really intended to, to be. I mean, it was supposed to be about the three Ps, product, uh, population, uh, participation and um productivity it was really about almost workforce issues um, and if, if there's anything that the intergenerational report does talk about it's about um, you know long-term change in policy and what what implications that has and that's that's really I think what the government's now coming to terms with that these things will take maybe 10 years to to uh, transition to and therefore you're going to have to have some level of bipartisanship on it so mm. i think in amongst all their short-term budget concerns um that is where they're going to be heading and if, if anything comes out of the igr it's that you know all that talk about how they were going to get back to surplus at the end of their first term ha ha is well and truly out the window and it's all become a very very long-term problem well i want to have a Okay, here endeth the Outsiders Part 1.